Gardens are made from plants. What we have in front of us is a near universe of things to choose from. Gardeners have every sort of color, texture, flower, leaf, and plant form at their disposal. Beyond the love of one thing and another is the happy task of putting plants together into gardens. Like many of us, one of the things Karen strives for from her gardens is a sense of completeness throughout the season. By completeness, we mean that gardeners want to be able to walk into their gardens anytime during the year and be satisfied by what they see. To make such gardens is neither easy nor quick. At the center of this enterprise is the placing of different kinds of plants that do a lot of different things. She has come to see plants in two main ways. First, plants that look good for all or most of the year. And second, plants that contribute interest for shorter periods. For example, the first group contains such things as small trees, roses, shrubs, grasses, and herbaceous perennials with outstanding foliage. The second group contains bulbs, biennials, annuals, and all sorts of flowering perennials. She calls the mixing of these two kinds of plants gardening in layers. The plants from the first group form a kind of framework in the garden where gems from the second group are fitted in and woven through, creating a garden tapestry. This gardening in layers is particularly suited to small gardens where it can be difficult to attain that full season look. A concrete example of this gardening in layers is the planting of spring bulbs among other flowering plants. Karen begins by placing colored flags throughout the garden. Each color represents a different kind of bulb or bulb combination. Using flags in this way gives the gardener an overall control of the design. Once the final arrangement is set, planting can begin. Karen has organized all she needs in a wheelbarrow. Perennial phlox, daffodils, scylla, cyanodoxa, tulips, and a compost sand mix. The orange flags get a Garden Club of America pink tulip. She plants tulips eight to 10 inches deep. Planting them at this depth will help them overwinter and may aid in their perennialization, that is their tendency to flower from year to year. After placing her tulips, she fills the holes with her soil mix to within four inches of the grade. On this, she places her small bulbs and covers with soil to the top. Tulip at the bottom of the hole. Soil mixed to four inches from the top. Pick out the bulbs you want, in this case, Scylla and Cyanodoxa, glory of the snow. Pop them in the hole and cover with soil. Not done yet. Next, Karen plants woodland phlox between the bulbs. Karen says this whole thing is a little like making music, and in a way that is what it is, a kind of music in the garden. Experiencing gardens as visual music allows them to be understood as compositions in time and space. At the rhythmic heart of the garden, is the natural coming and going of plants. Waiting is one of the realities of gardening. You get an idea, carry it out, and then wait. Karen's gardening in layers idea begins to show with the first stirrings of life in spring. One of the fundamental things we know as gardeners is that not everything that happens will be planned for. But with luck, most things will happen more or less as expected. There will be scylla and small species tulips like lilac wonder pushing their way through lamb's ears. Hybrid tulips galore with daffodils and phlox stolonifera with anemone blanda. 
There will even be room for some personal delights like these curious Fritillaria meleagris, which look like something a breeder set out to do, but in reality are wildflowers. And the exquisite, fragrant Narcissus thalia is adrift in a sea of blue Phlox divaricata. And there'll be discoveries to file away for future garden dreams, like the surprising blush-red foliage of young roses. The first vining shoots of Clematis viticella start their dance in the garden. Karen begins early in the season to give her small garden clematis a hint or two about where she would like them to grow. Many will be trained around her roses, and others up into the small grafted globe blue spruce trees she has about in this garden. One moment in the garden is the staging point for the next. Each spot is transformed both by time and the choice of plants the gardener makes. At the top of the little spruce tree, now a splash of the purple Clematis viticella Polish spirit. And at the foot, a community of plants, from pink Betty Pryor roses to blue Allium ceruleum to Stachys byzantina, lamb's ears. In another corner of the garden, Clematis viticella Madame Julia Korovan has woven through Artemisia schmittiana, silver mound. Scrambling along the ground and through other plants is the delicate Clematis texensis, Duchess of Albany. And plants are not the only things that live in these gardens. All kinds of birds and butterflies are attracted to flowering gardens. And not all plants are in the garden for their flowers. This is the wonderful blue oat grass with the exotic botanical name Helictotrichon sempervirens, sounding more like a foot fetish than a worthy addition to the garden. Adding the light-hearted, icy cool Allium ceruleum to this garden scene strikes just the right note. Knowing that Clematis Ville de Lyon is of the right size and growth habit to suit this David Austin Mary Rose will take some reading, experience, and time. At the heart of this sort of gardening is a knowledge of plants, a willingness to think in original ways, and a readiness to take chances. And if all goes well and fortune is on your side, you will be rewarded with moments in your garden that will take your breath away. among the most cherished in gardens. Whether they are the stately perennial orientals, or the gaily colored annual Californias, or the delicate silky Shirley's, poppies are for gardens. A year ago, Harlan gave Karen a start of Argemone squarosa, commonly known as the prickly poppy. Desert plants by nature, Argemones have all the appeal of other poppies crepe paper flowers and wonderful architectural foliage. Everything but the flowers on this plant are prickly, especially the flower buds. Karen always grows out new plants in a test area. Before you can know what to do with a plant, you will need to know what the plant will do. Chief among its charms is the remarkably long period of flower. Argemones bloom for months from June till frost. Though they will continue to flower with or without removing spent flowers, an occasional grooming can greatly increase the number of flowers. However, you will need to let a few pods develop seeds. Our gemonies are naturally perennials, but too tender to survive our winters, so we grow them as annuals. Prickly poppies will self-seed at random around the plant. If you wish to have them in another place, you will need to collect seed from the ripe pods. These little poppies resent root disturbance, so if you're going to start them indoors, you will need to do it in individual pots.
Whenever taking seeds from your plants, be sure to label your packages. In the case of Argamony, you can directly seed them in your garden, where you want them. The seeding area should be a sandy loam, and all you need to do is rough the surface with a scratcher. Sprinkle the seeds about liberally. They can be thinned later. Pat the soil lightly to bring the soil in contact with the seeds and water well. By early spring, our gemonies are up and growing. They will need to be thinned. 10 to 12 inches apart will do. A great deal of the pleasure in gardening is watching what a new plant will do. And this little poppy has certainly been a delight. Aristotle remarked that rue was a palliative to the nervous indigestion caused by eating with foreigners. Ruta graviolens is one of those plants that has been around in gardens for just about as long as anything. Whether it has any special medicinal properties is not our concern. We are interested in it as an attractive garden plant. Rue is used in our gardens for its lovely mounds of blue-green foliage. Its leaves are a smoothly cut filigree. Yellow flowers are born in small clusters at the top of the plant. Seed heads are quite decorative and can be used in dried arrangements. After flowering, rue becomes diffuse in appearance and a little ratty looking. This gives the gardener something to do in late June. I love the combination of this foamy baby's breath and then the sharp iris pallida. Uh, I, the rue is the same color as the iris pallid of the dark green, and I thought it'd be a great combination, but I, in my mind, had this as the picture does a globe, and you're telling me we can sculpt them into the shape we want, right? Certainly. We have to remember to cut them back a little bit because there's going to be more growth, and we want to get that overall shape after the growth, so we just simply go in and sculpture the plant. That looks great. It's becoming a dome already. I have to wear um, gloves and long sleeve shirts because I get a reaction when it's sunny and it's humid. Yes, there are certain people that uh, can't uh, take chances and they do uh, suffer from a dermatitis uh, from certain kinds of plants. I think this is really a nice looking plant. Uh, this plant was used uh, decades ago in the uh, making of cheeses. Well, today I'm using it because it makes, first of all, the form of it, but the foliage is so fine and it's this blue green that looks so good in the garden. Well, you're going to be very happy with the way this develops now. These fresh blue-green mounds of rue will hold their form throughout the season. At the front of this garden is the wonderfully showy Missouri primrose, Enothera macrocarpa. This American native grows only to 10 inches in height. Missouri primrose makes an ideal frontline plant, and its three to four inch dreamy pale yellow flowers are exceptionally large for a plant of this size. Another yellow flower for June is a little member of the onion family, Allium molly, with a common name of golden garlic. If you give them a pinch, you'll know why. Karen has planted hers so they will show through Gypsophila paniculata compacta, baby's breath. And around this lively combination, she has placed one of the best foliage plants for sunny gardens, Iris pallida variegata. Its chief attraction is the remarkable visual energy produced by the leaves. Pallida is swift to rise in the spring and can be seen with the earliest things. Variegata's leaves contrast well with blue grape hyacinths, Muscari armeniacum, just about the best bargain in blue for gardens. By late May or early June, Iris pallida comes into bloom with Geranium Johnson's Blue and Allium Giganteum Globemaster. This is the one with the good foliage. Globemaster's purple flowers are the size of small melons and are carried on erect 24 to 36 inch stems. 
The contrast in flower form alone makes these three plants ideal companions for the spring garden. The delicate iris flowers are pale lavender with a yellow beard. A quick note about the fragrance of this flower. It reminds us of nothing so much as the sweet childhood memory of cheap grape candy. When flowers pass, simply cut the flower stalks back at the base. The foliage of Iris Pallida is an important and dramatic part of these gardens from spring through fall. When a friend calls and says, it's time, the garden is beautiful, things are dropped, keys are found, and off you go. Last summer, Karen got such a call from a dear friend, Mary Bay, gardener extraordinaire. She gardens a patio with real panache. Among her passions is topiary. It's the way the plant grows, yeah. It just grows in this wonderful, gnarly kind of a way. You can see down there, doesn't it look oh, old? True. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It really it looks does. like a bonsai. Yeah, yeah, it does. Besides a keen wit to pull this sort of thing off, you need old hangers and bits of nylon hose. It takes patience and imagination to fashion herbs into all kinds of things and a true determination to keep them going year in and year out. And that was the focus of her shaping hand has been common rosemary, Silver Santolina, and Taxus. And what of Mary's patio? Well, there's no end to the plants she employs to create a world of private charm and beauty. Annuals, biennials, perennials, mixed all together. In this corner, an annual verbena amor little pink. And in this corner, an aggressive perennial, cerastium, snow in summer, trapped by wall and ties one of the best uses of this plant we've seen. And the way all this goes together to make a welcome. Her perennial Coreopsis moonbeam next to Aster Fricartii monk. Two frogs and a container of pink geraniums makes for delight. And this nervy blending of every sort of plant is carried throughout. Here, Swiss balcony geraniums at the foot of a tree in a pot. And under the kitchen window, impatience, and a waterfall of tender variegated ivy. One can only imagine the pleasures in making a garden like this. And what about those extraordinarily weedless bricks? Asked Mary's husband, Bud. Gardeners have been in love with climbing plants forever. They climb our arches, our fences, and walls. The true darlings of these climbers are members of the Clematis clan. In recent times, gardeners have been nearly overwhelmed with the varieties available. Under such a happy burden, it becomes the gardener's job to explore ways of using these wonderful plants. Last spring, with the song of birds in the air and tulips, blue flax, and allium in a frenzy of flower, Karen tied her clematis jackmanii to a tall cage she had built in her garden. The trick here, as always, when tying a plant to a support is to keep the tie loose to prevent the stem from snapping off in a wind. Another important job is to give this climbing thing an idea as to where you would like it to go. Without a hint or two, you will have little but a large blue-violet snarl for your trouble. Clematis jackmanii puts on an incredible amount of growth in one season, and your supports will need to be strong. By the first week in July, Karen is back taking flowers for arrangements. A few other clematis that Karen has used on cages in this garden are Comtesse de Bouchard with pale pink flowers. A little double-flowered viticella, purpurea plena elegans, provides a nice contrast of form. And a dark purple hybrid of jackmanii, the president, is a good candidate for growing on a support in the garden. Something gardeners need to be alive to when choosing clematis for the garden. Match the plant to its host. 
Here, Karen holds the exceptionally fragrant sweet autumn clematis. It is obvious that the vigor of this plant needs to be considered when placing it in your garden. In general, Karen uses the kinds of clematis that are cut nearly to the ground in late winter and flower on new growth. In spring, the sweet autumn clematis can be trained up the trunk of a tree. As the season progresses, so will the vine, up through the branches and spilling over the top with its sweetly scented flowers. The vitality of this clematis terniflora can also be put to good use as a ground cover for large areas. Clearly, clematis are as much fun in the garden as they are on walls and fences, if not more. Enter the world of lilies and you have entered the candy store for gardeners. Gardeners are never at a loss as to what to do with them. Because of their elegant form and nearly endless range of colors, they can be used almost anywhere. While none flower for long periods, the different kinds can bloom in our gardens through most of the season. Here a sparkling Asiatic lily, yellow blaze, has been planted with giant reed grass and the lavender blue globe thistle in a sunny border. The contrasting colors and forms of these plants make an extremely lively summer combination. The tall lavender globe thistle, Echinops retro, is a hardy plant, easily grown, and can provide that touch of whimsy to a garden combination. And the extravagant Arundo Donax versicolor, or giant reed grass, is simply a stunning addition. But gardeners beware, in areas where this grass is hardy, it is a spreading sod former and should be placed with care. In Karen's zone four garden, it does not overwinter. Not all types of lilies will need division, but this Asiatic yellow blaze is a vigorous grower and will need a division every few years. Late summer or fall is a good time to divide them. The advice given as to exactly when to accomplish this task varies from source to source. But Karen has always had good luck doing this job in late summer when the foliage shows considerable signs of wear. Lift the clump out of the ground and knock off the excess soil. Gently pull it apart, keeping the roots intact. Individual bulbs come loose from the clump easily. This lily has been in this spot for five years and has become overcrowded. Happily, it's one of her favorites, so she will have more for other places in her garden. Near the top of the bulbs, you are likely to find small bulblets. These can be removed and planted in a separate bed. The planting hole should be deeply prepared and amended with copious amounts of compost and coarse sand, for they require a highly organic and well-drained home. Bulbs should be set at a depth of two and a half to three times their height, and six to 12 inches apart, depending on the variety. As we return, Karen is finishing up the subsoil preparation. This hole is large enough for three or four bulbs. Bulbs are placed with their roots intact, about 10 inches apart. Finishing up the planting with a nice load of compost and sand should provide a good home for many years. Ideally, these lilies would like a full sun location. Here's the rub. They would like their feet to be in cool shade. This provides the gardener with an ideal situation for overplanting these guys with other things. In this case, Karen is putting in compacta baby's breath. Next spring, the baby's breath is in its glory with the fine lemon yellow flowers of Missouri primrose, Enothera macrocarpa. And of course, our lilies are up and going. By mid-July, the divisions are in flower and making their presence felt in the summer garden. Puzzling out which plants not only complement each other visually, but also share common cultural needs is one of the sweeter tasks a gardener has.
Lilies are among the most achingly beautiful of flowers. By themselves, they can be deeply satisfying. But gardening is not about plants in isolation. Something happens when one kind of plant is associated with another. Living things are transformed. It's a kind of alchemy.